please give me a warm welcome to your DAV National Headquarters Executive Director, Cody Van Boxel. All right. OH. There it is. All right. Thank you, Commander, for your introduction and leadership over a very eventful term at DAV's helm. And thank all of you for coming. As an organization of people who share common experiences, tell me if this story resonates with you. A new general arrives on base to take over as commander. As she tours her new home, she sees two young Marines guarding an obscure bench under a shade tree. When asked what they're doing, they tell her their vigil is part of a long-standing base tradition. But they aren't sure what's behind the tradition. She asks the outgoing commander about it, and he tells her he has no idea when or why the bench became a duty assignment. But he wasn't going to be the one to mess with the tradition. So she calls the commander before that, and the commander before that, and the commander before that. No one knew. Finally, she reached out to a sergeant major who had been stationed at the base 20 years prior. She asks him, Sergeant Major, we've had two Marines on permanent detail guarding an obscure bench near the parade deck for as long as anyone can remember. Do you know why? Sergeant Major was shocked. Ma'am, he said, are you telling me that paint is still wet? <laughs> <laughs> DAV is not an organization that does things simply because that's the way they've always been done. The minds. Thank you. The mindset is imprinted on everyone on Team DAV from our national adjutant down, and it's part of our daily approach. And that's important because the terrain that we operate in as a charity is continuously changing. The need to advance and evolve is constant. Not only that, the needs of the veterans we serve and the ways we engage the public to support our cause are ever-changing. It's been said that even within a single family, every child grows up in a different home. Similarly, everyone who joins the military, even those in the same fighting hole, has a unique experience. I spent almost all of 2007 in Iraq as a Marine security guard. Our task was to protect our nation's personnel and secrets. From one of Saddam's former palaces, we face regular attacks. We reacted to the threat of suicide bombers and took incoming fire. Lives were lost while I was there. And through the intelligence we protected, we were intimately familiar with the evil that was being committed beyond our zone of control. Some of that evil was all too familiar to a revered DAV leader who was serving at around that same time in Iraq. Our own past national commander, Stephen Butch Whitehead, was operating out of Convoy Support Center Scania when he helped capture a high-value target named Ali Tariki Yusum. Caught with a rare find, a mortar site, he was a bad guy who could have been much more effective than the average jihadist at attacking American interests and personnel. And that would have been of considerable concern to Davies Dan Clare, who is today our Chief Communications and Outreach Officer. He was, at around the same time, choking on burn pits at Balad, also known as Mortar Ritaville. Though we each served along a 200-click stretch of Route Tampa, our experiences in that theater are very different. And they're even harder to compare to the experience of DAV's Assistant Legislative Director, Naomi Mathis, who lost an airman she felt was like a brother to her, Staff Sergeant Patrick L. Griffin, Jr., died in an attack along the same route a few years before. Naomi was a single mother when she enlisted in the Air Force and endured three deployments apart from her children. After that, she transitioned out of a service to a VA less than prepared to meet her needs as a woman veteran. Comparisons and conflicts or eras are rarely productive. Just ask anyone who served in the infantry in Vietnam. Though most of their combat tours lasted one year, Compared to those who fought in the Pacific for the duration of the war, the mobility of helicopters made it possible for them to experience six times as many days in actual combat in the course of a year. So before you make a comparison, 
Ask Don Inns about Beirut. Or Rob Reynolds about the joys that come with jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. Or Dick Marbs about how it is to live 65 years without a leg because of an illness in service. Or Delphine Metcalf Foster, who slept her first two weeks in Saudi Arabia in a body bag for warmth before she and her fellow soldiers had to begin filling them. Or anyone who drank water at Camp Lejeune, or who was a survivor of MST, or who were injured so severely in training that their military careers were cut short. Dee, we must honor them all, not with a broad brush, but in recognition of the sacrifices each made individually in uniform. If we hearken to a specific era, we should do so without prejudice or preconceived notions. We cannot and should not ignore the adversity that comes with service, regardless of how anyone is changed in uniform. But we also must make every effort to understand the experiences of the veterans who serve of all eras, including those called to intrepid duty in extremely perilous situations. This year, we mark two decades since the Second Battle of Fallujah. There, our own faced the heaviest urban combat we'd seen since Way City, which is its own battle with its own unique lore. Few among the living, myself included, can grasp the chaos and insanity that so many faced over those six weeks in the winter of 2004. But the courage they showed and the violence they endured demand our remembrance. Just ask DAV member Aubrey McDade. On his second deployment, when pinned down and with two of his Marines wounded in a firefight, Aubrey heroically and selflessly charged to the front of his squad to take on an enemy who was determined to die. Because of his actions, two Marines who would otherwise have died were saved, and the remains of Corporal Nathan Anderson, who gave his life, were recovered. I just remember seeing all these explosions, man purple and green sparks and pink and red flames all in the midst of the city. I still don't really process that this is real life. This is really happening. Uh, these, these machine guns that's going off, it's not simonition. Like it's real gunfire. These explosions that are happening, these buildings are really crumbling. I think Fallujah tells a story bigger than Fallujah. I think the story of us in that fight and what it takes to endure that kind of trauma and that kind of hardship, if you will, is the same thing it takes for this country to be as great as we claim to be. You don't, I don't care how good you are at acquiring your sights and squeezing the trigger on the enemy. You can't go and do the things that Bravo Company 1-8 did without being a band of brothers, without loving each other, without looking past each other's difference. I wouldn't wish Fallujah on anybody, um, especially when you think about the outcome versus the, versus the risk. But I also don't think there's anybody else that can do what we did. That's not even a beat on the chest. That's just then it's all in your assignment. <laughs> Aubrey received the Navy Cross for putting himself in harm's way to save his brothers. You can learn more about the anniversary of Fallujah through the exhibit hall in Hall 2 on the lower level and in an upcoming special multimedia feature on the battle and those forever changed there. And Aubrey will be joining a guided discussion about the battle this evening at 6.30 in the West 207 Lecture Hall. He embodies the concept that we, as individuals and as an organization, must never leave our own behind. To do that, <laughs> to do that, to live up to our charge as the organization that ensures promises are kept to veterans, we must take a global view on how we execute our mission and meet veterans where they are. We must do the same with our volunteers and donors. 
This year, we held our first National Community Impact Day. The thought behind the project was to set aside a day to engage our members and re-emphasize the importance of DA volunteerism. Fortunately for us, when he's not capturing high-value targets in combat, past National Commander Butch Whitehead is one of the people leading volunteer initiatives. Today we're doing the Community Impact Project and what a wonderful day, bringing together some fellow veterans and giving back and helping uh, a spouse of a veteran today that is, you know, challenged herself because of things she can't do anymore. And uh, helping her do some of the uh, projects around her house here. This has been an absolute gift that I'm getting today with all of these wonderful people. Yes, it was work, but it was a lot of fun work, though. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the best part of this whole project is I didn't have to ask. It's just made such a big difference. Volunteerism is just one way we can customize our efforts to ensure the unique needs of veterans are met. But it's also one of the areas where, as DAV leaders, we can make a significant impact by simply asking people we know to help out. We always need drivers and folks in hospitals to augment the care VA provides, and we're getting very creative in how we leverage local media to help recruit in that area. But beyond our next Community Impact Day in April during National Volunteer Month, we should look at the local veterans assistance program as a cure-all for leveraging the unique abilities of interested volunteers and fulfilling special needs that would otherwise go unmet. Barry spoke yesterday about membership, and I don't need to belabor any of the points he made, but I do want you to know that we're doing more and applying more strategy than ever before in our history to recruiting people to join our ranks. We're doing more to provide resources for recruiters and incentives for people to join. But if you're not tuning in and sharing the great information we're putting out there, if you're not aware of tangible and intangible benefits of joining DAV, your fellow veterans need you to sharpen up. To help, we've created something special that will give you the confidence and tools you need. At over 1 million strong, DAV members are the lifeblood of the organization. That's why recruiting new members is so important. Your ability to get your fellow veterans to join DAV takes continued familiarization with all facets of our mission and life-changing services. The DAV recruitment resource is designed to help set you up for success. You can find digital and printable versions of the recruitment resource on DAV.org. For quick access to the recruitment resource, save a link to the home screen of your phone or tablet. When time is short, start with the elevator speech. It's a concise overview of the importance of a DAV membership. The rest of the guide is designed to answer potential members' most frequently asked questions. The digital version provides links to web pages, forms, videos, and other resources, while the printable version has a QR code that veterans can scan to pull up links to those same items. Don't forget to give potential members your Recruiter Warrior link or QR code to easily sign up from their own device. DAV is always looking to add new members, and with your help, we will continue to help keep our country's promises to the men and women who serve. That resource and many more are available in the Member Resources section of our newly enhanced website. But if that's not enough, as many of you know, we have an exciting new incentive 
that could literally win you millions of dollars. All right, I know what you're thinking. I said millions of dollars. And then the video said $2,500 and a trip for two to Las Vegas. Well, this contest will give you almost a full year to cash out all your change jars and pool your money. The millions you could win is then up to you and your luck at the casinos. <laughs> I suggest you put it all on red and let it ride. <laughs> However you bet, DAV can't unfortunately cover any losses or the taxes on winnings. But still, one great reason you should go out and recruit. DAB is constantly looking at ways we connect with the veteran community. In addition to our increasing engagement across all major social networks, DAB expanded outreach to an area that our founders never could have foreseen. DAB is now using the interactive live streaming channel Twitch to reach gamers and people who use the channel for entertainment, sports, and music. We are meeting veterans and those who support us where they are. DAV on Twitch will give veterans an opportunity to engage with our organization from their living rooms. We can answer their questions, direct them to resources, or recruit them to join, volunteer, or even participate in legislative advocacy. We continue to build and enhance relationships with the media, and our partnerships with the UFC and other companies should make it easier for our chapters and departments to activate locally. The only strange thing about having DAV's name on the mat is that it changes the way you experience the sport. Instead of cheering on a fighter, I find myself hoping that whoever ends up getting pounded out on the mat does so near, but not covering, DAV signage. <laughs> we'll be producing new public service announcements this year. The donated inventory we receive year in and year out over the past decade has achieved nearly 80 billion impressions at a value of nearly $850 million. That is almost $1 billion in free airtime. This year, we conclude three years leading DAV Patriot Boot Camp. That's another program that truly meets veterans where they are and empowers them to succeed as entrepreneurs. I hope many of you were able to experience a taste of that program with the Patriots Pitch Contest Friday night. That program is going to continue to change many, many lives in ways that are truly awe-inspiring. It goes well beyond teaching a veteran how to fish, as the saying goes. Through DAV Patriot Boot Camp, veterans are teaching other veterans and creating a community of support so our founders can succeed on an entirely new plane. Where most veterans surrendered their prime entrepreneurial years in order to serve, DAV is giving them the tools and networks they need to make the world of business accessible to them. Not only are they creating jobs, they're coming back to DAV to find out how they can give back and hire more veterans. Speaking of employment, DAV career fairs continue to empower. In addition to providing a direct conduit to veteran-friendly companies, DAV is doing more than ever before to create content and advise veterans on how to succeed in their careers. We're working with the for-profit sector to educate employers to not just hire veterans, but to support their growth and retention. We're thinking out of the box and opening our charity to experts who want to improve the lives of the people we serve. Our own past national commander, Dave Riley, a quadruple amputee, participated in John Hopkins University's multidisciplinary design program. Working with students who will be some of the top engineers of their generation, Dave collaborated to help with the design of waterproof prosthetics with the hope that it would enable arm amputees to perform basic hygiene procedures autonomously. In addition to the prosthesis, which they named Remora, an integrated and self-contained bath system called the Barrel Solution was proposed, which would provide sponges for cleaning, rinsing, and air drying. 
And anyone who knows Yvonne Riley can agree, while Dave benefits from increased independence, she would get the respite of a peaceful cup of coffee while he's in the Dave washer. <laughs> Although these contraptions might not be as practical and useful as Dave would probably like, this is one small part of a continuous path of innovation and expansion in the services we offer and the way we conduct our business. And I want to thank you, our member leaders, for making DAV an experience in your communities and for your flexibility and innovation in creating solutions for veterans where you live. It's hard to believe we're marking 20 years since some of the heaviest fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's impossible to calculate the full toll those in previous areas of wartime service have had on our community, whose members have shouldered the cost of our nation's liberty. With the support of so many DAV chapters and departments, our adaptive sports programs are one of the most inspirational occasions in which we can see our community come together. At the Winter Sports Clinic, we recognize the special veteran whose participation was emblematic of the spirit of that event. Everything is happening so fast when you're recovering, you're learning how to walk. When you're here in the mountain, it kind of slows it down and it kind of makes you appreciate life more. Our two rounds landed close to where I was, um, which actually resulted in my uh, army that was nearby close to me exploding. Shrapnel penetrated the back by the, my right ear, and they pretty much shoved up on the back. Um, and came, they stopped right in my right frontal lobe, causing me to uh, obviously have a traumatic brain injury and uh, be paralyzed from my left side completely. I was in a coma for two months, so I thought I was dreaming. I, I could process everything. I could hear people talking. I couldn't talk. They didn't think I was going to recover. Um, or at least they didn't think I was going to walk, talk, or be independent at all. Fortunately, with the VA and the uh, other um, help, I was able to recover and get, get some type of independence back. Coming here to the uh, mountain pretty much changes your whole perspective in life and what's possible and what's not possible. Not just by me doing it, but watching other people do it, they inspire you. Everybody goes through something. Even if they're not disabled, they go through some adversity. So seeing people out here at the, in the mountain is pretty inspiring. My favorite part of the Winter Sports Clinic is um, the activities, but also is uh, bonding with the veterans. It's, it's giving me a chance to connect with them and, uh, find, and find kind of a sense of of uh, belonging. Without meeting Eric, it never would have gotten to the point it is right now. It was just a click. And the thing was, I can help you and you can help me. And we came together like that because we're vets, man, okay? And next thing I know, uh, he is cluing me in on all of these adaptive activities saved my life. What I would like to do is help people that are going through experiences that I went that I went through because it's pretty difficult. I said I try to say like don't take that as that's what you, that's that's your like what you're gonna get. Like I was given the same way like I'm never gonna do this and look at me now. Eric is a very nice young man. It's been amazing the progress he's made since his injury. He was told he would not walk or talk again. And now he's out here skiing at the Winter Sports Clinic. It's just amazing. And he's giving back to other veterans now, encouraging them to be strong and progress in their recovery. And that's why he's so deserving of the DAV Freedom Award. Skiing brings a new sense of purpose to your life. Like, I can do a lot of things I enjoy being active. Um, obviously, with the help of uh, professionals, but it's still, it is, it is some, at least something to look forward to every year. 
I want to do this as long as I'm healthy. I want to keep doing this. And that's my plan. Eric Castillo paid a tremendous price while defending our way of life. This year, he marks his 20th Alive Day. And while his story showcases the resilience and potential of veterans in our community, he also reminds us of the foundation we stand upon as inheritors of DAV's legacy. From the equipment he uses in the video to the healthcare system he relies on for rehabilitation, and on into the benefits he's earned and the life he's able to lead decades after sacrificing so much for our nation. All of this is possible because we, as a band of brothers and sisters, have fought for more than 100 years to ensure our own are not left behind. I mentioned before, that making comparisons in eras is difficult. But in this case, I want to make a special shout out to the veterans of a particular era who gave my generation the welcome home that they never themselves received. If you're a Vietnam War era veteran and you're able, will you please stand up or raise your hand and remain standing for just a moment? The vast, the vast expansion of opportunities and benefits and the public's consciousness of its relationship to veterans owes a huge debt of gratitude to all of you. It wasn't that long ago that I returned home, dusty, tired, and dirty. I vividly recall the group of Vietnam Air veterans that met our plane in Atlanta and welcomed me home. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for helping everyone here achieve a larger measure of success at any time in our nation's history. Madam Commander, this concludes my report and I humbly yield any remaining applause to those that were just standing and welcome them home.